Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to give a talk at ICAR. My name is Kujin Cho. I am a director of uh, Biorobotics Lab and Soft Robotics Research Center at Seoul National University. Uh, as you can see, I'm a uh, designer, robotics designer, who designs soft bias by robots. So today I'll be talking about uh, learning from nature to design new type of soft bias by robots. And uh, I've been fascinated by uh, nature, such as this kind of uh, small insect, it's a water spider, actually jumping on water. Walking on water is not that easy, but as you can see, uh, jumping on water, how does these water spiders do this? And can we actually replicate this motion by using a robotics technology? That was a question I had uh, back in 2008. And I started looking into how we can actually understand, because no one actually knew how these water spiders can jump on water. Another example is this ladybird beetle opening their wings. Uh, ladybird beetles have their wings tucked under the shell, and they open up their shell, and the wing that was folded before opens up like really quickly, and then it starts flapping. So these kind of uh, nature, uh, if we can understand these kind of natures, we can build uh, bioids by robotics. So it's uh, bioids by robotics is not just uh, me, but there are several other researchers who work on this area. And we try to find smart solutions for nature to design robots that can overcome unstructured environment in a new way, with a new concept. Uh, and uh, when we say we do bias by robotics, many people think that we copy nature. But as Professor Bob Full at Berkeley, a biologist, has said, you will fail miserably if you just try to copy nature, because nature is way too complex. So what do you do? What do you have to do? You have to learn from nature, and you cannot just copy them, so you have to extract the key principles. You have to extract the key features. And then you use the best engineering solutions to design this kind of robot. And also for controlling, Instead of just using sensing and control, feedback control, you need to embed control to body parts. You tune the legs, you tune the feet, you design it in such a way that they can actually, instead of going through the whole neural system, there's a mechanical feedback that can automatically adapt to the environment. So those are the key things that when you're designing bias by robotics, you have to keep in mind. And some of the related concept to this is embodied intelligence. Uh, from the book, How the Body Shapes the Way We Think, uh, from Professor Rolf Piper, uh, uh, he said that uh, behavior is not the outcome of an internal control structure. Computation is outsourced to body morphology and material properties. I also heard uh, Professor Ronnie Brooks one said that uh, artificial intelligence, you have to really think about the body. Without the body, you cannot think about how the neural uh, is composed. So, from my viewpoint, as a robot designer, my viewpoint is to then you have, when you design a new robot, you have to think about the morphology and the material properties. And you have to try to outsource the computation to the body morphology material properties. That way, you will be actually able to simplify the control and do the great things. So the implication of this with the uh, embodiment is, its implication of embodiment is that the instead of going through the whole feedback loop from controller to mechanical systems, task environment and sensory system, there are two small other loops. So one is the mechanical feedback, which is a feedback which does not go through the sensory system, but it directly uh, directly interacts with the environment and the mechanical system. And another one is the internal physical stimulation that actually senses the inner body. We call it uh, preproception. And with that, 
we can actually embody uh, the intelligence into the system. So this is a, uh, our initial try on uh, trying to build this uh, water jumping robot. So what we did was we just used the traditional components, like uh, some clicking uh, energy storage in the element, and we tried to jump on water. And obviously, we failed with a lot of splash on it. And the, we got a clue about how to jump on water from the flea. So not many people studied the water sliders jumping, but many people studied the flea jumping. And in the paper back in 1967 by uh, Bennett Clark, uh, there was this diagram about the fleas jumping. And what was interesting to me was that instead of having just two muscles for jumping, normally you need two muscles, one for flexing, one for extending extending your leg. But the flea had another third muscle called trigger muscle. And that was interesting. What does this trigger muscle do? It actually pulls the muscle. And by pulling the muscle, extensor muscle, what it does is it changes the torque direction. So from the energy storage here, when you pull this uh, spring on the extensor, you get a large energy storage so you can produce large amount of force and torque. And what this, this trigger muscle do is it actually pulls the extensor muscle and then changes the direction of the torque and it can actually make the flea jump. This is very different from the mechanism that which most of the jumping robots use, which is called the escape and cam mechanism, which was developed by Leonardo da Vinci. And the very big difference between these two uh, mechanism was the maximum reaction force. If you use the Newton reversal mechanism, I thought that we could actually reduce this maximum reaction force a lot. Instead of having a large initial force, you can have a pretty decent amount of maximum reaction force and you can still get the same amount of momentum, so same jumping height. So what we did was we first built a robot that could jump on, on the uh, ground. Uh, so it looks similar to the flea is we try to uh, we try to mimic what the flea does and it was able to jump about uh, 30 times its uh, body height and then what we did was we extracted the principle we simplified the design so we removed the trigger muscle made it into a compliant passive triggering and we were able to actually build a robotic water strider this small size so we don't still know how the water striders do it, but we made a hypothesis from the fleece mechanism, and we were able to actually show that by following this principle, you can actually jump on water. And this experience of learning from nature to designing this robot, and actually this robot was used to actually verify how the water striders can jump on water. So this was a, a very interesting experience uh, we had. And another example of Ladybird's Beatles uh, thing. So we uh, we follow a very similar approach as I showed you uh, about the water jumping robot for many different uh, types of robots. And this is one another example uh, following the Ladybird Beetles feature. So what we saw is the that the vein of the wing enables this kind of rapid deployment because the vein has a feature of a tape spring shape. So because of this tape spring shape, they were able to rapidly deploy and self-lock. So it's not just about deployment, it has to be locked, and you can do it with a very simple structure. So what we did was we actually uh, mimicked what the vein of the uh, ladybird beetle does, and we actually built something like this with a, a compliant origami. And we were able to show that if we use this component, we can self-deploy pretty quickly. And it has a pretty large amount of uh, moment in order to be uh, in order to be bent again. So we use this mechanism to design a jumping and gliding robot. In order for the robot to jump and glide, when jumping up, you need your wings folded. 
and it has to be opened up in a very short amount of time. So this is a slow motion video, so you can see the uh, wings open up, it opens up really quickly, so we can use it for this kind of purpose. And as you can see, the compliant origami can withstand large amount of force, whereas the others cannot. So we can use this uh, as a wing that's folded and it opens up and it could be used for uh, flapping uh, and flying. So learning from nature, the best thing or the very important uh, nature is obviously human body. So we try to learn from human body, we try to learn how the human moves and we try to build robots. And uh, probably you've seen this video from Boston Dynamics. It's really amazing. We could only see this kind of motion from a movie. We could not see this from a real robot. But now, this was released early this year, we can see that these kind of robots can perform these kind of amazing movements. So do we still need to learn about human body, how the human body creates motion? Well, human body has over 600 muscles, 4,000 tendons, 900 ligaments. It's much more complicated than how the robots are built. So maybe there is something more that we could learn, something more that we could learn and use it to improve the quality of life of people. I started getting interested in the uh, learning from human body when I had a chance to meet a uh, SCI patient and we were trying to develop a feeding robot, a robot that could feed him. And we interviewed this guy and we were quite surprised because what he said was, I don't want robots to feed me. I don't want helpers to feed me. I don't want robots to feed me. I want to just eat by myself. And only if I can use my hand, I can eat by myself. So, you know, give me something that I could use. That was also quite, uh, quite an experience for me because we thought that if we, you know, give them a robot, a functional robot, they would like it. But the people with disability, it's not just about the function. They want to live like a uh, person without disability. They want to perform what the person without disability can do. So when we looked at this uh, technology of wearable robots back in 2010, uh, there were only these kind of rigid type of robots. So as you can see, when you say wearable robot, you imagine a Iron Man, right? So you have these kind of shells, and then you help those shells help you move. But so if you look at this kind of wearable robot, what's going on is you design a robot and then you attach the human body. So even without the human body, the robot can still move. So you need frames, you basically build a frame, right? The robot has to have a frame. And then you attach your human body. But what we thought was, okay, if you look at the human body, the human body already has frames, the bones. Bones are the frames. They cannot move their hands, not because they don't have a frame, but because their muscles don't move from you know, different reasons. So what we said was, okay, let's see, you know, the humans have these pulleys and tendons. So the tendons are attached to the bones using these pulleys, and they actually move. So what if we can remove the frames? and just use, instead of using this mechanical components, use some fabrics and very lightweight uh, things. The problem we had was actually the human muscles are directly attached to the bones. So the force transmission is very good. But if you try to do this outside of your finger because of the skins, it's not easy. So we had to come up with a solution of like somehow, instead of just attaching these tendons uh, directly onto the skins or like the glove, we design these kind of dimples uh, that pulleys. So it actually mimics the insertion of the muscle and the pulleys. And what it does is instead of applying a force that's in the axial direction, 
Now the forces are applied in the normal direction to the body. So now the force transmission is much better. So we learned these kind of things from looking at how the human body is composed of and then with our intuition. It's not the data. Well, maybe it is a data, but it's something that we recognized and understood and then using our brain with the intuition, we come up with these designs. Can we do this with machine learning? Well, maybe in the future. Another component that we put in our robot is what's called underactuation. Underactuation mechanism is something that's inside every car, differential mechanism. The front wheel, two front wheels, there's only one engine, but two front wheels, when they rotate, they have to rotate in a different speed, right? The way they do that is using a differential mechanism. If you use that mechanism, it automatically adjusts itself. So if we impl uh, implement this into our robot, that's what we did in a very uh, lightweight manner, we can actually, we don't need to control two fingers differently, but we just have to use one motor to pull and they would automatically adapt itself to the shape. So this was a very important thing because we didn't want to complicate things too much. We wanted something that's usable right away. So we built a soft wearable robotic hand called Exoglove. So we started this project back in 2010, uh, 9, 10, as the word soft wearable robot came out uh, around 2012. So before we were calling our robot frameless exoskeleton, but we started calling it software with a robot hand. It had three fingers, it's fabric based, tendon driven. Using a motor, uh, we basically have something like a bicycle cable that we pull the fingers and the under actuation mechanism. And there is a dual slag enabling actuator. So we were able to show that using this exoglo, somebody who cannot actually normally SCI patients. So it's interesting, almost half, 50% of people in the wheelchair cannot use their hands. And there is no solution for them, even now. There is, wheelchair has been around for hundreds of years, but nothing like that. So we started building this. And uh, as you can see, we have built a under actuation mechanism so you can grab different things. And uh, what we found was to truly assist the disabled for their independent life, it's not just about the function. It's not just about you know, grabbing things. You have to be able to use this for everyday life. So bathing, toileting, dressing, cooking. So not just the functional performance, but usability is very, very important. Adaptability, wearability has to be easy to wear. Hygiene is important. It has to be able to be used in a watery environment. A deadlift is important. Compactness is important. So we designed a new uh, exoglob poly. We basically changed the base material from fabric to polymer so it could be water resistant and could be cleaned easily. And the thumb was changed into passive, we reduced the number of uh, motors, and we used the under actuation and dual select enabling shader. So as you can see now, we can open up the glove and we can make it easy to wear so it wearing takes less than one minute and for safety we had this kind of teflon tube coverings it could actually adapt to the hand size uh, because of these uh, pattern design and the key technical features of under actuation mechanism and the dual slag enabling actually is still there so as you can see on the video from the left side it's just one motor that's driving those two fingers, and when you block one finger, one finger is blocked, but the other one still moves, which means when there is a rugged shaped object, the two fingers will move until they are uh, touching the, the body of the object. So we built this, uh, and for the, uh, we asked the uh, People using this, we gave them an EMG sensor, we tried them different things, and they said, okay, we like the mechanical button there. So we used the mechanical button, was able to grab something. We had the actuator on the wheelchair. So it's uh, waterproof, so you can use it in, uh, in, in, in the bathroom. It's easy to uh, you know, clean, because uh, on the hand side, there is no 
electrical components and it's just the uh, mechanical components there. And when you say mobility, it's not just about the wheelchair, it's about the hand as well. Because if they cannot use their hand, they cannot open the door, which means you need somebody else who opens the door for you. So, um, you know, intention detection is a still a big problem. And many people study using EEG sensor, EMG sensor, and various different types, but there is no very robust way of doing this. You need calibration for every trial, you need additional actions, and mechanical switches you are limited to single output. So we wanted to increase the usability. You know, can we do an intention detection from a natural motion of uh, your various intentions? So what we proposed was instead of trying to get the biosignal to uh, understand what the human is trying to do, together with Professor Somo Jo at Kaist, he's at uh, Computer Science Engineering, we discussed a lot and you know, can we use maybe we can use vision to do this. And we we just thought, you know, if we use the vision, maybe we can do the intention detection. We didn't really understand you know, whether this would be possible or not. But after doing several experiments and everything, we understood that oh, when we capture the arm behavior and also the hand-object interaction, so if we capture the movement of the body plus the surroundings, we can actually do a intention detection. And what this implies is if you have a video camera on you, you will be able to actually understand what the human is trying to do. It's like a second brain, it's like a second person watching you and trying to control the robot for you. So instead of trying to get the biosignal directly, you are having you know, this kind of uh, different method, different paradigm. So we have, we call it VideoNet, it's a vision-based intention detection network. So it's, we used it for our hand robot, but we believe that this concept can be used for all types of wearable robots. So, you know, what we did was instead of using this kind of uh, button method, we, uh, with the camera and the glove, it, it predicts the user intentions from the arm behavior and hand object interactions. So it's, it's the behavior of your body part plus, plus the surroundings. So we proposed the algorithm called VideoNet. The structure is basically CNN plus RNN. I don't know the details of this, but uh, Professor Song Cho can be uh, better at this. And uh, it's not just about, we did our role, my role and Professor Song Cho's role was, were not separate. We had a lot of discussion. I didn't understand machine learning very well. He didn't understand our role very well. But after talking a lot, because our robot had this kind of uh, embodied intelligence, physical intelligence in it, we were able to create this kind of uh, algorithm. It's, some people might think this is very similar to robotic hand grasping objects, but this is very different. It's actually much easier, much simpler. And we were able to come up with this kind of uh, uh, labeling. So labeling is also very simple. We labeled the rest grasping and releasing, and then uh, no object-related labels or name, no any other labels. And uh, we just use single object red bottle to train our uh, model, and we verify the intention by measuring the EMG and comparing it with the video net. They matched pretty well the grasping and the releasing. And we tried to understand, so what's really going on? How did video net interpret the inter uh, intentions? Because machine learning is a black box. And as a mechanical engineer, we want to understand what's really going on. So we uh, uh, prepared this setup where we measured the distance from the hand and the object using an IR sensor and the armrest. We had the reference block, we had a linear guide, and we, tr uh, we tried to measure these kind of uh, uh, the, uh, comparing the learned object versus unlearned object. We activated uh, uh, the uh, algorithm and the robot, and VideoNet didn't learn the specific object, and VideoNet learned the existence of object. That's what we found. 
from these experiments. And also we compared the hand speed. Is the speed of the hand, does it really matter? And we found that they don't really affect our results. But what affected our result was the attack angle. So attack angle is an important factor. So which means that uh, from this attack angle, there was uh, the intention embedded in it. And uh, so we were able to uh, show that the person who normally cannot grab this kind of object can now grab it and uh, he doesn't have to press a button or you know there's an EMG sensor, just a camera and he can use it to control. Uh, I mean he's not actually controlling it but the robot is uh, automatically grabbing the object when his hand goes close. And we did it for many different objects and we were successful in many different cases. So maybe if he wants to you know, drink a coffee, you know, he can just go ahead and you know, approach the object and it will, it will grab itself. So another thing that we wanted was, you know, fingertip force feedback. So we need the fingertip force feedback. Uh, just like human, robot requires uh, not uh, the finger joint configuration for the object size, but for object stiffness, we need the fingertip force feedback so that we can grab fragile objects without breaking them. Of course, we can attach sensors, pressure sensors, but you know they become complicated, more expensive. So they're also vulnerable to water wiring issues, those things. And inspiration from human is that humans also have what's called Borgia tendon organ, which actually gets a, uh, it's a proprioception that receives information from the tendon. So it senses the tension of the muscle. And the rule is that when there's too much tension, you inhibit the muscle. So uh, we place the sensor on the actuator so we can measure the tension and we can do a force control based estimation. So there, it's waterproof, no wiring in the globe it, itself. And there were several issues. Compliance of the hand and the soft glove is an issue. And nonlinear characteristics are the issue. Dynamic movement of the sheep itself during the grasping was an issue. And uh, what we did was we looked at the nonlinear behavior uh, due to bending angle of the sheep. And uh, the nonlinear fingertip force versus uh, the flexion tension relationships and we found that nonlinear characteristics are highly related to the bending angle of the sheath. So uh, instead of putting input as a motor encoder in the wire tension, we use the sheath bending angle uh, as an input as well. So does input and output have correlation? So, uh, we looked at if there's a significant trend difference. And we came up with a, uh, it's called a uh, uh, what, we, what we called a bending time gradient RSTM, where we, as an input, we use the sheath bending angle, and uh, uh, since it highly affects the nonlinearity, we said there is a higher impact on more recent sheath bending angle. And with this algorithm, we were able to better uh, improve the algorithm of the RSTM plus just using the shear, uh, the the motor uh, tension from the tendon. So this also came while we were discussing a lot together and we were able to you know, come up with you know, what to use, what to measure in order to improve our uh, sensing system. We also do software with design optimization. So we have to design, uh, optimize the design. And this approach is, I guess, much easier for machine learning to approach because we have data. We, what we can do is we can, uh, because if we want to solve the issues of the example of polyfinger body, which is that uh, finger body tilts, and depending on the size of the finger body versus the finger, there is issues of the wearability. So if you use a topology optimization, which is normally used for rigid structures, we can actually come up with a new design, new pattern design. 
So this is a optimization, but it's you know starting from just whole block, you come up with this kind of a pattern design. So if we define our problem such that we can use this technique, it is possible to use this technique to design. So that's what we did. We uh, we did, did, uh, we defined our problems by defining the extension in plane bending and torsion, the three components to look for. And we designed and we came up with a different design from the previous design. And this new proposed design were actually better for the wearer. So that was uh, about the hand, helping the hand movement of a, a person with disability. So this is another problem uh, that people with disability, people, a lot of people in the wheelchair, they also have respiratory assistance. So when you say rehabilitation, it's not rehabilitation of the limbs only. If you go to hospitals, there's a lot of uh, uh, respiratory rehabilitation as well. And what we found from uh, this person is, if you see this uh, video. So as you can see from this video, uh, a lot of people in the wheelchair, they have weakness in respiration. So he cannot normally, uh, he has problem making a sound. Sometimes if it's severe, breathing is a problem. Uh, he cannot cough. He cannot cough. So if he cannot cough, uh, the mucus gets stuck on the throat and you could die of it. Also, some people cannot even speak of, because of this problem. So these, uh, the, uh, what they do is they have a mask. They put the mask on the people, but cannot, that mask cannot be used in the everyday life. And as you saw in the video, if a person pushes the belly, this is a normal practice, a helper pushes the belly to help them cough out the mucus. And as you can see, you can make a bigger sound if you can push on the belly. So what we did was, you know, compared to wearable robots for interacting with the limbs, we need a wearable robot for visceral interaction that interacts with internal organ. This case, it's a lung. So we developed ExoApps, which is a human-assisted wearable robot for internal organ through a biomechanical chain. And uh, inspired by human abdominal muscles, we developed this kind of a belt type robot that could actually contract and release. So this belt-based pressure transmission assembly, we looked at the muscle arrangement, we looked at the plantar contraction, and we looked at the overall wall, wall motion, and based on those kind of information, we customized the assembly, we did the stiffness design, and also we installed the, uh, we designed the in install configuration. <laughs> And go. So this is the result. No This has a lot of potential. And also, you know, we need to control. So instead of using a joystick, and we do an automatic control. So effort synchronized assistance. This is a breathing assistance, in a precise manner, using a spiral manner, as you can see. You can actually measure the breathing, and using that measurement, you can help often to assist the uh, breathing even more. And even without that spiral manner, by measuring using the plethysmography and the microphone, you can actually uh, pressurize his belly and assist in the breathing. Also, coughing assistance. Uh, you see, using this pyrometer, you won't have enough uh, coughing force, but this belt will help you, and you will have to decide how much. And also, for uh, safety reasons, we can we can also do like this kind of uh, speaking assistance. Uh, so while he's speaking, you can see the belt is driven, so it helps him. Uh,
So what we envision is this kind of, uh, we met this uh, stroke patient and uh, he could not speak well uh, because he did, does not have enough belly force. So if you see from this video, he's trying to say 안녕하세요, which is hello in Korean. Without assistance, he cannot say much. Very little. With a small, mild assistance, he can say a little bit more. With the pushing, now he can make the sound better. So we are on a, on a very uh, pre-trial on this, and we hope someday we can build a device that he can use every day and enable him to speak. So uh, final comments. I think understanding the physical intelligence of nature, embodied intelligence of nature, we can create new, meaningful physical interactions that can solve some real problems. My question is, can we use machine optimization, uh, can we use machine learning to design new robots? For design optimization, yes, meaning that if you have previous data, if you have the uh, data or if you can create data, if you can simulate and you have data so you can do optimization, you can come up with new designs, but learning from nature for novel concepts, not yet. But maybe someday there could be this kind of intelligence which makes you know, this kind of design decisions, which we do right now by looking at nature, understanding them intuitively, and then coming up with this kind of novel designs. Can we use machine learning to improve control? Yes. But obviously, choosing which data to collect is very important because there's many various parameters inside the robot. So maybe collaboration with a domain expert, just like we did with uh, Professor Sawajo, I think it will expedite this kind of improvements much better, much quicker. And there are many important problems that has to be solved in this area of decision making and controlling and designing. So I believe that if you combine the physical intelligence, physical embodied intelligence with the learning intelligence, uh, you know, we can probably create something new and something better. And as I showed you earlier, human body is very, very complicated. There's a lot of problems that humans also have. And I know when you say healthcare, it's a lot about imaging. It's a lot about using the data that is sensed. But what I'm trying to do right now is trying to actually have a physical interaction with the human, with the robot. And in doing so, this kind of soft body robot, soft uh, robots, soft bio-inspired robots are very important. And in designing and controlling this kind of uh, soft body robot, physical intelligence, embodied intelligence is much more important than those rigid type body robots. So we need a lot of help from this community to improve our robots. And these days, there's a lot of soft robotics uh, researchers. Uh, there's a lot of people who work in what I'm working on. I'm sure there is one in your uh, university or in your area. Please interact with them. Talk to them. I'm sure you'll find a lot of new problems that you haven't seen before and that can truly help uh, improve the quality of life of many people. So these are students and former students of my lab. I really have to thank them. All those uh, concepts, intuitive concepts, it's not just me. It's together discussion with my students. We came up with those ideas. We have a lot more uh, new uh, type of robot, novel type of robots. So thank you very much. If you come to our website on biorobotics lab or software robotics research center, you'll be able to see uh, a lot more. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll take uh, questions. Thank you.
Hi everyone. Um, this is uh, the keynote with uh, Q, Q Jin Zhou. Um, and please, as a reminder, type all your questions in the rocket chat. Um, I'm Francisca Maya. Uh, I'm a research scientist at Facebook AI Research. I work at the intersection of machine learning and robotics with a focus on lifelong learning. And I have to say, I found this keynote very inspiring, uh, this idea that we can design robots by looking at nature, extract, extracting principles from nature, and then designing robots that can help humans in these various ways. I, I thought that was very inspiring. Uh, so thank you, Kyuchin, for giving this uh, keynote. Um, I will quickly introduce Kyuchin now. Um, Kyuchin Cho is a professor and director of Soft Robotics uh, Research Center and the uh, Biorobotics Lab at Seoul National University. He received his PhD in Mechanical Engineering from MIT and his Bachelor and Master's from Seoul National University. He was a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard Microrobotics Laboratory before joining the uh, Seoul National University in 2008. He has been exploring novel soft bio-inspired robot designs, including a water jumping robot, various shape changing robots, and soft bearable robots for the disabled. He has received the 2014 IEEE RAS uh, Early Academic Career Award for his fundamental contributions to soft robotics and biologically inspired robot design. He has published a science paper on the water jumping robot and several papers in science robotics with novel, novel robot designs. He also serves as a RAS as Associate VP of Publication Activities Board and will serve as VP of the RAS Technical Activities Board next year. And today, Q uh, presented a talk on soft bodied robots for human centered design of robots for everyday life. Hi, Q Chin. Hi, Francisca. Thank you for inviting me. It uh, is great to be here. Very, yes, it was very nice to meet you, like virtually meet you. Um, as a starting question, could you kind of give us a summary of what your key message is that you want people to take away from your keynote today? Yes, so uh, for, so I thought about what the message would be for this machine learning community through my talk, because it's a little different community that I don't really present. And uh, so what I do is I learn from nature I design new type of robots, and then we can build something that's novel, but very uh, uh, lightweight, effective uh, design. And uh, I was wondering if machine learning community can come in to this area and uh, uh, based on what the nature is creating these kind of novel movements, can we learn from that, recreate it into uh, robot designs would that be possible? Because uh, if it if that would be possible, then then we will be able to uh, iterate a lot more than what we are iterating right now on designing new type of robots. Which means that we'll be able to come up with much better robots in a faster pace right. than what I'm doing right now. <laughs> so, it took us about six years to build that water jumping robot. It took us a very long time to build those uh, like wearable uh, glove robots as well. But then if we can expedite that process, then uh, there's many people who need this kind of technology out there. And if we can expedite this process and customize it to you know, different people, you know, much easier than how we are doing it right now, and that would be great. So, right. Um, actually, there is a question in the chat that kind of relates to this, so I will uh, read it uh, to you. And this is a qu question from Katya Hoffman. Um, Thank you for the impressive talk and work, Professor Kiu Jin Cho. <laughs> I'm especially intrigued by the interdisciplinary collaboration between between you and the robotics space and ML experts. In your view. What are key things that people with an ML background should be aware of when collaborating with domain experts in the robotics space? Yes, uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. 
I think uh, so. Collaboration in general, I think it's it's a hard process of understanding each other. Understanding each other takes time, which means that uh, you have to be uh, you have to respect the other domain people. Uh, for me, I was lucky because I had a very close friend of mine who was working in the machine learning area, so we had a chance to talk a lot. I wasn't afraid to ask you know dumb questions. He wasn't afraid to ask dumb questions, and you know from there we could explain it to each other, and then you know, find the ways. And also, we have to try we try new things together. And when you try new thing, I mean everything could go wrong, right? Which means if you're not really respecting each other or you're not really close to each other, you might end up blaming the other person for the failure. <laughs> so you don't want that to happen. And so I think having that kind of a close relationship where we could actually continue you know, moving on after failure is also a very important, uh, important part of, uh, of the, our collaboration. I guess it's not just the collaboration between the machine learning. And if I talk a little bit more about the experts of machine learning versus our domain, it would be that uh, so what we actually agreed on was we want to find new sets of data, new type of data, I would say, because what we, uh, he and I, what we agreed on was uh, something that could be truly innovative will come from a data set that no one has right now. So how do we produce that kind of data set? And because I'm not a machine learning expert, I don't know, you know what kind of data. I know my domain, but I don't know what the data is. He doesn't know our domain very well, so he doesn't know, you know exactly what to extract. So that's why we had to try, try, and then try to understand. And uh, from, I think that's an important process. Yeah, uh, I think this is uh, such a good message. And maybe you could help us understand what it actually takes to design such a robot. Can you like walk me through a cycle mm -hmm. of designing such a robot? Mm -hmm. So for example, our water jumping robot, so we started with uh, observing the nature from outside, meaning we saw it jumping on water, right? We saw, saw the jumping on water and then started to think about what would make it possible. Why would, you know, how would this be possible? And from there, we sort of uh, made a hypothesis to jump on water, okay, we need the force. The force cannot be too big, because if the force is too big, you know, the water will break. So in order to jump, you need large momentum, which means you need to increase the time. And then we, had, we asked ourselves, okay, the question is, how do you generate this small force long time with a simple mechanism? That was the question you know, I had back of my mind. And then, start looking. Uh, I read a lot of biology papers. So I guess that's similar to collecting data from all different you know, <laughs> sources. So I tried to collect data from all those sources and then try to find a match between what I had, had in mind versus you know, the, the data, the sources that I'm getting. And of course, that match is not exactly the same, but I found a similar match while I was reading through the flea, uh, flea jumping paper. So although they didn't exactly say what I wanted, but I was able to catch from their explanation. So I extracted the principle behind what they were saying, and then I was find, able to find that match. That's a, as close as I could get. And then, so after that, I took about three, four more years to build the robot. So 
that's not the end of it. So we, I found a close match, and then we, we produce it. We reproduce that concept in an engineering way. And then, after we design our robot, we again have to understand what we designed. Because we sort of, you know, like design in an ad hoc manner. Of course, we have the principle in our mind. But then we have to, after implementing all the details and everything, we try to better understand what's going on. So we use the modeling. Now we can model, because nature we cannot model, but robot we can model. So we use the modeling, we use uh, different experiments, and then we try to understand why it failed, and then recreate once more, and then you know, try to understand. And then finally it jumped on water. And we still didn't know how it jumped. So we <laughs> tried to understand what really happened by trying different variations. So we created different types of robots, different types of robots. A simulation of different robots, and then I guess we understood much better how it really worked. And then we were able to make it into a you know, like a principle. Okay, this is how it's it's being done. So I guess that's the process that I went through. <laughs> it's it, the first time I explained this process in this manner, but <laughs> I, I hope you understood. <laughs> uh, I. I think uh, I understood, uh, and I definitely, you know, you you learn to appreciate how hard uh, uh, robotics and designing robots uh, is. So thank you for this. I would love to actually dig way more into this, but there are questions popping up in the um, rocket chat that I uh, want to ask as well. So I'll move to the rocket chat questions. Um, a question by Sue. From um, I'm so sorry about the names. Uh, I will not do it. <laughs> okay, so the question is: the breathing voice support project is fascinating. In such projects, what is the right balance between passive dynamics of the soft robot and active control, perhaps with predictive models of the user? Uh, so we call it effort synchronized control. So uh, balance means that. We sort of know the required volume change. So we know how much volume is uh, has to be changed when you're breathing or when you're singing. Uh, you know, we sort of uh, we, we assume that we know. Uh, and then we measure how much uh, how much the movement of uh, from is, I mean, the person can still move his belly. It's not like 100% uh, unmovable, so he moves, but we know the difference between the desired movement versus the actual movement, and then we compensate that error with our uh, robot's movement. So that's a basic, basic principle, but in reality, uh, we don't exactly know how much volume he requires unless we know what he's trying to do. So we, again, here we need intention detection, right? So if we, for example, we could sort of say, if he's singing, we can learn the note, and then from that note, we can sort of extract how much volume is required, and then we can, I guess, you know, uh, we can actually our robot to give that much uh, more effort. But then, if you're, he's trying to speak, and we don't know what he's trying to say, right? It's going to depend on, so that will be tricky. But if we have to find some way to exactly predict how much uh, volume of air he needs, then we will be able to do that much better. Um, yeah, it's actually very interesting. Exactly this uh, intent prediction. This is where you uh, have also already used machine learning, as that's mm -hmm. as you presented in your talk. And there's a question about uh, this in the chat as well. I'm curious about your work on cross persistence intent prediction. Um, I'm assuming an ML machine learning based uh, solution to prediction will make some errors. Are there ways in which machine learning errors can be dealt with, each, for example, through an engineering or uh, user interaction solution? 
So it's a, it's a very good question. It's as a, for general infection detection, that's a very good question. For our case, it worked very well. So we didn't have <laughs> that much issue of the error because for our case, as I explained in my presentation, it was uh, sort of a simple on-off, uh, on-off intention detection. So it depends on what type of intention that you're talking about. For our case, it was much simple intention because our available glove had the embodied intelligence so that we didn't have to actually control the movement of individual fingers. If we had to control the movement of the individual fingers to exact you know, position, then we would have to deal with those kind of errors. But in our case, because our robot had that embodied intelligence where if you just uh, you know, actuate your uh, motor, then it will adapt to the surface. So we didn't have to deal with those kind of errors, first of all. So that's one of the reasons why it worked very well, because the only intention that we tried to detect was whether he was actually trying to grasp or not. It was like on-off detection. So that was, uh, that's why in my uh, presentation I emphasized, you know, it's the physical embodied intelligence plus machine learning. If we work together, then it will simplify the problem and then it will work much better. So that's one thing. But still, there could be errors, and I'm sure there, if, if we had some problem with the errors, we would have worked together to find another parameter to, to put in from the domain knowledge. For example, in our case, we knew that the angle of approach was uh, very important. So maybe we could have used that parameter for learning to improve the uh, prediction. But actually, we didn't have to do that in, in our case. But that's that kind of uh, understanding of what's really going on will you know, help improve those kind of uh, prediction errors. Um, that's a fascinating. Thank you. Uh, we are almost out of time, if I, I believe my clock. Uh, but I really want to ask this uh, next question and, and then close, so I hope we won't be cut off. Um, uh, so there's one more question um, in the chat, where well, there are multiple more, but at least this one. How important is interpretability of machine learning models as a consumer of machine learning models? What would you like to see developed to aid your understanding of these models? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, that's a very good question, because uh, as a mechanical engineer, we want to understand what's going on. <laughs> we have to understand what's going on. I guess the reason that we want to understand what's going on was is to uh, uh, make sure that uh, uh, we we are like fail safe, for example, because we don't know whether unless we understand what's really going on, we don't know whether it will work in all different cases. I guess that's the uh, that's the thing that I have in the back of my mind. So that's why we try to. Uh, understand, but uh, if if this uh, right now I know if you have large amount of data and if you can consider all different cases, then you don't have to worry about this. But for robots, I think it's not easy to get all different like cases. For example, autonomous driving case, maybe you, you will be able to reach that because there is a lot of data being collected from all those. In the cars, but I don't think for robots it's not going to be easy to you know, gather all the data. So that's why we want to understand what's really going on to make sure that we know, you know, how it's working. I'm not sure if that makes sense. But. Yeah, it definitely makes sense uh, to me. Even though I work with uh, robots that are easier to work with and get more data with, uh, I still have the same problem. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I agree. <laughs> Um, okay, so it's already 9 a.m. at the end of uh, the keynote uh, Q&A already. But is there one last message, one thing that you would like to say to this uh, community? 
So, I mean, first of all, really thank you for inviting me because it was a very uh, good learning experience for me as well. I didn't really think about my work in this kind of manner, but uh, after giving this talk, I'm more convinced that we need more machine learning people getting interested in what we're working on. <laughs> so, hope, uh, hope from this talk there will be more people getting interested in what we're working on. Soft robotics is, I think it's something, especially the robots that's close to our human body, you know, something that could be wearable, it could be something near us. So robot means that it's naturally safe and it's more natural. So we want to build more soft robots into our real life, even in the manufacturing setting. And we need, because it's much harder problem than the rigid body robots, we need a lot more, a lot more brains. <laughs> so uh, I hope uh, I was able to intrigue you guys to come into our community and hope to see you guys in our community. <laughs> Thank you again for giving this uh, very inspiring talk. And thank you all for asking uh, the questions in the rocket chat. Um, and I think that is it. All right. Thank you very much.